And I hope everyone has marked on their calendar of plans to uh, attend the church conference on Monday, November the 16th. It's all, the whole, all, all charges, all charge. Stafford, St. John, Andrew, it'll be here at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're hosting, so we'll have cookies and coffee following. So if the parsonage documents are in order, then immediately following that church conference, St. John will have an additional one only on the parsonage. And if, if things aren't ready, the DS will cancel it that evening. So, And by having it as a church conference as opposed to a charge conference, that means every member of the church gets to vote, not just committee members, but everybody. So, does anyone have any announcements that you can make? Yes, everybody bring cookies on the 16th. Good idea. Please. Or you'll put up a button. I don't make. Okay. Uh, if you would all uh, stand and join me in the call to worship. This is found in your bulletin. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. There is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship Him. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him, bless His name. If you would bow your heads, we'll have our opening prayer. O oh God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. For the unity of the church we pray, and for fellowship across the embittered lines of race and nation, to grow in grace, building in love, enlargement and service, increase in wisdom, faith, clarity, and power. We dedicate our lives to Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. And if you remain standing, our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Love, Excelling, is found on page or number 384.
breakfast, I tell you what. We have some talented folks here. Uh, and thank you to all those who served us this morning. I want to start our time of prayer with uh, sharing of joys and concerns. One more reverend yesterday, you know, uh, at Canada uh, with the Southern Baptist. The Southern Baptist? Yeah, they are looking forward to you guys actually. All right. Us too. That's always a good time for us. Yeah. Well. It's a good time for me because I love that. Minister to the 
members of, of the Kenwood residents, and we ask, Lord, that, that you would guide us each week as we, uh, in the ministerial association, serve that community. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the faith that is, that is represented there among the residents. And Lord, too, we want to remember Norma Bright and Carol Farrell, uh, who are in the hospital this morning, and all those near and dear to us, even those that we have not mentioned yet this morning. We pray, Lord, for more rain. Uh, we give thanks for the rain that we have received, but Lord, we ask for more uh, to get uh, to get across up and going and, and healthy root systems. Lord, we need that for the crops, but we also need that spiritual rain in our lives. And so we pray for that for all of us here. For those who are traveling this morning, who are not with us um, because they are on the go, we ask that you would bring them home safely to us. For those who are not here because they are ill, we ask, Lord, that you would you would raise them up from their sick beds. Lord, in all these things we give you praise. And now would you join me as we pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals again to number 165. Hallelujah. What a Savior. <coughs> Again and again, 
as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for immortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. If you were hungry, really hungry, would you read a good book or would you eat a good meal? Not that there's anything wrong with reading a cookbook. Many find reading cookbooks to be enjoyable. It's a hobby for a lot of people. But a cookbook in itself is not very nourishing. How many Christians concern themselves with how they appear to others? Not just in how they might dress, but their outward behavior and associations with others. How many are trying to eat the cookbook? How many totally miss the concepts of interpersonal, radical, and heartfelt transformation? Jesus did not teach us a set of rules of a religion to control us, rules that serve as constrictive boundaries for our lives. We are not slaves to rules. We are slaves. We were slaves to sin. But Jesus says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. A child belongs to it forever. And so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It has been said that the Ten Commandments uh, are like a list of ten rules how not to fall into a well. Yet in all actuality, we were already in a well long before Jesus enters the picture. But we were at the same time not aware that we were in a well. We think we were made to live in wells, and therefore we cannot understand why we are so unhappy in a well. The Ten Commandments provide us with the awareness of the well that we are in, but provides us no escape from it. Many people in churches around the world today continue to eat the cookbook, unaware that there, 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 that there is a meal that satisfies. They are imprisoned in a well, but don't realize there is a way to freedom. The question of the day is, does God have a final solution to this problem? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is God's final solution. It supplies our need to have our consciences cleared once and for all. The writer of Hebrews is telling us today that Jesus is the winch to pull us out of the well. He leads us to keep us from falling into any more wells. The tabernacle and there, then later the temple with its regulations and sacrifices as we read in Hebrews this morning provided a powerful image to the world. That image reveals that God's Messiah would be able to, would, would be and do what God's Messiah would be and do to deliver his people from the condition of sinfulness. My parents live in California. Uh, who knows why? But 
I have pictures of my parents. And I would say that a photo is not adequate to bridge the gap between Kansas and California. Um, I can talk with a photo. I cannot talk with a photo or hug a photo. Now today we have Skype and things like that, which helps. But specifically talking about a photograph or a picture, I can't talk with a photo or, or hug a photo. A photo is an accurate representation, but it is not the real thing. Here in Hebrews 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 24 to 28, we learn uh, three advantages to living in Christ Jesus in contrast to the picture of the temple or the tabernacle. First, a new arrangement has come in Christ that is beyond space. The old system with its temple, rituals, sacrifices, limited worship to one particular place made by human hands. But in Christ, a new system is beyond space. The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, as it all is also described, is not a limited is not limited to space. It is the realm of the spirit. A new dimension has opened up to us in such a way that wherever we go, so goes the kingdom. We distort the idea of heaven when we limit it to a place saying that heaven is somewhere off in space. When Jesus makes the spirit of a person live, he brings heaven into the soul, into the heart. We just sang the hymn that illustrates this so well. Love divine, all loves excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love, thou art. The relocation of heaven within our hearts brings heaven to earth. And while it is already in our hearts, heaven is also something not fully yet to be grasped. And that is another sermon for another time. Heaven already being here allows Paul to declare to the Ephesian church, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Heaven is in your heart because Christ is there. It is God who makes heaven what it is, the spiritual realm. When these bodies die, we simply enter into a deeper reality of heaven than we could ever experience while in these bodies. It will involve a concept of space, though. Since there will be a resurrection of the body, there must be a location for us to exist and live. And that location is heaven. And that's probably the, the best way to summarize that not yet part of heaven inside us. The beauty is, in this teaching, uh, comes to us when we discover that wherever we are, there he is also. For he said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He appears before the Father on my behalf within me. And that work is going on all the time. Whenever I, wherever I am, He is available to me, doing work in me. The writer of Hebrews goes on to, the point, uh, to point out that the old system required continuing repetition of sacrifices. The effects of these sacrifices don't last, and every time a person sinned, they had to bring a new animal sacrifice. The old arrangement required repetition. But our second major point today is a new arrangement has come that is beyond time as well as space. The sacrifice occurred at one moment in time. However, its effect, its power, extends into eternity. 
past and future. Now, how does this work? Well, the saints of the Old Testament have as much access to Christ as we do. This, his sacrifice is fully theirs as it is ours by faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham trusted in God's provision of a Messiah. He told his son, God will provide the sacrifice. How beautiful. The cross works just as well in the 21st century as it does thousands of years before Christ. It is a current event in every time in history. The power of Jesus' sacrifice transcends time. Therefore, no work of penance or remorse on my part can make it any more effective. It is pot its potency is timeless. And so how much more effective is Jesus' sacrifice over the old system. Thirdly, a new arrangement has come that is beyond judgment as well as beyond time and space. Beyond judgment. In the temple or tabernacle, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, bearing with him blood to be offered. Before he entered, on that day only, he stripped off his beautiful garments and put on a simple white robe. He took the bowl of lamb's blood and went into the Holy of Holies, while the people waited outside, trembling in fear, wondering if the sacrifice would be acceptable before God. If it was not, the whole nation would be brought under judgment, because when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he was facing the judgment of God. There is even a legend that they tied a rope to his ankle, so that if he collapsed under the judgment of God, they would drag him out. In these events, God says to his people that judgment awaits people when they die. The message paraphrases the words, in Hebrews 9.27, everyone has to die once, then face the consequences. Once we die, and once only. Then it's time to face the music. Judgment is coming. There was a story about a great revivalist preacher who began a sermon once by reading this verse, this very verse. He had to start over three times because each of the first three times he began, someone in the congregation fell dead, surrounded by shrieks and screams. You can bet that after that third death, that preacher had everybody's attention for the rest of the sermon. But listen, when the when the high priest came back out of the temple, he was not wearing his white robe anymore. He had changed back into his beautiful garments, his ephod. And he came out with rejoicing and thanksgiving with and for the people. And that's what it is like in the sacrifice of Christ. He entered by death into the realm of our spirit into the human heart, into our inner life, and therefore he is now invisible to the world. They do not see him. But when he appears, it will not be to judge us. For by faith, the cross has already done that. For the Christian, this judgment is already past. And in the Spirit, we live already in the age of peace. The judgment that we must face when we die has already been faced when we died with Christ. God's judgment has been poured out upon Him. You know, when the pioneers settled the Great Plains, sometimes prairie fires swept by the wind 
blew from horizon to horizon. And these fires posed a great threat to wagon trains and homesteaders alike. The pioneers used a tactic that was greatly effective. When they saw a range fire heading their direction, they would start today what is today called a back burn. And essentially, they would light another fire. When the second fire had burned enough area, they would move their wagons or their possessions into that area that had already been burned. And it would save them from the larger fire. For when the fire approached that burned out spot, it had no fuel to continue burning. The cross of Jesus Christ is a place where judgment fire has already burned. Those who trust in the cross and the rest of the judgment and, and rest in the judgment that has already been visited upon it have no other judgment to face. The sacrifice of Jesus wipes away all sin. And this is how Paul can say in Romans chapter 8, verse 1: Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the realm of the Spirit, we have already been seated in heavenly realms. Forgiveness is already ours. If by faith we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We now need only confess our sins, acknowledge our fleshly transgressions, and forgiveness is ours. We therefore give thanks and receive it. What freedom we have been given from our guilty consciences. The sacrifice of Christ is God's final solution. Soon we will return, bring, He will return, bringing salvation to those of us who are waiting for Him. So we pray, Lord, we await your return with patience and yet with great anticipation. And thank you for the cross of your mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And lead us, we pray, into holiness by your Spirit, for your name's sake. Amen.
beyond what we could imagine. Thank you for showing us people of faith who live according to your word. Guide us by your spirit to be like the poor widows of ancient days. People who trust in you wholeheartedly, free us from fear so that what we will open our hands and faithfully share our tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. After you open your hands to 715, rejoice the Lord is King.